All right, folks, in our last video about Ronald Dworkin, we took a look at what he calls the moral reading of the Constitution, the way that he thinks judges ought to start with the original intent of the framers, but then work their way through the sometimes changing precedents of the court over the course of time, and then faced with perhaps a new situation where they can't really be certain what the intent of the framers would be to actually use their moral understanding of the tradition and precedents in order to reach new decisions. And he says, we don't need to be afraid that this is anti-democratic in a certain sense. Indeed, it is the very fulfillment of democracy. So as I said, in order to convince us of that, it would seem he'd actually need to give us a new understanding of what democracy even means in our tradition in order to sort of push us along this line. So what is his argument for democracy? That's what we're gonna cover in this video. What is this argument? that can convince us that an unelected body of nine judges, all perhaps from elite law schools, elite backgrounds, that they are in fact a democratic body. What we're gonna see is that Dworkin wants to sort of combine arguments for liberty and democracy to show that the one flows from the other and that the way that they're joined together is through an argument for equality. So Dworkin argues that the Constitution and American traditions are best understood as being based upon what he calls principles of equal concern and equal respect. This is the argument that he makes in the article assigned to you called What Rights Do We Have? It's a really complicated argument, though. So I've actually outlined it for you on a handout that's on classes. Get that handout and take notes on it while you listen to this lecture. OK, on page 272 to 273 in that article, he says that equality is really actually the central concept in liberalism. So for those of you who say rights or freedom is central to a thinker like John Locke, Dworkin is saying, no, equality is central. And equality generates two principles, equal concern and equal respect. So one, to treat fellow citizens with concern means to treat them, quote, as human beings who are capable of suffering and frustration. So that is, we must be concerned about people's material conditions, at least to the point where we ensure that they're not suffering. Now, two, to treat fellow citizens with respect means to treat them, quote, as human beings who are capable of forming and acting on intelligent conceptions of how their lives should be lived. So respect seems to be the traditional foundation for rights. Think of Locke here and his argument that we're all born free because we're all born with the capacity that he calls reason to make our own moral decisions. Now, Dworkin says that when you add together equal concern and respect, what you get is basically two sets of concerns that have been very traditional to liberalism. The two sides of the question of justice. Concern is related to justice in our material interests. Respect is related to justice in our rights. So for instance, Martin Luther King Jr., when he led the March on Washington, it was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Jobs, material interests, freedom, rights. Dworkin says this on page 273 of the What Rights article. Government must not only treat people with concern and respect, but with equal concern and respect. It must not distribute goods or opportunities unequally on the ground that some citizens are entitled to more because they are more worthy of concern. It must not constrain liberty on the ground that one citizen's conception of the good life of one group is nobler or superior to another's. So here you see again, concern is equal to material interests, respect is equal to rights. Then the argument moves on from there. Dworkin says on page 273 of the What Rights article that equal concern and respect generate two further rights. The first is relatively unimportant. It's what he calls the right to equal treatment or quote, that is to the same distribution of goods or opportunities as anyone else has or is given. The second right, more important for our purposes, is the right to treatment as an equal. And they seem to mirror each other in some ways, right? The right to equal treatment, the right to treatment as an equal. But he thinks the second one means something different. He says, this is the right not to an equal distribution of some good or opportunity, 
but the right to equal concern and respect in the political decision about how these goods and opportunities are to be distributed. Those who will be injured have a right that their prospective loss be taken into account in deciding whether the general interest is served by some policy. Okay, equal concern and equal respect generate those two principles. Now, the second of them, the right to treatment as an equal, itself generates two principles. And we'll call these the arguments for democracy and the arguments for judicial review. And these can be seen in that article, What Rights, on page 273 to 274. The argument for democracy goes like this. The right to treatment as an equal means at least that I ought to formally have an equal vote in decisions that affect me, whether with respect to resources or with respect to rights, I ought to at least have a formal say. Or in other words, I ought to have a hand in democratic decision making. So Dworkin's not focusing here on the moral capacities that each of you has to make decisions, although he does mention those moral capacities. It's important to note this because Jeremy Waldron, who we'll study next, actually does focus on that moral capacity. Dworkin focuses instead on the obligation that you all have, an obligation based in justice, as we saw, to take my concerns seriously and so to listen to me. But the effect is ultimately the same. The argument from equality justifies democracy. However, Dworkin says, it's not enough for you to formally listen to me. The argument from equality, as I've said, has a second consequence, the argument for judicial review. I must actually be heard, Dworkin is saying, and my interests must be taken seriously if need be. Or in other words, as Dworkin says, I ought to substantively have my concerns respected. So he's relying here on a distinction between formal and substantive, which we've already seen in some of our cases about due process law. So you could think about an example which we actually haven't used, but it'll illustrate the point. We could imagine a black defendant receiving a trial in front of people who are all from his hometown. So they are therefore in some sense, all a jury of his peers, but we might be concerned that while he's formally being given a trial by a jury of his peers, substantively something unfair is going on here. A white jury formally fulfills the requirement, but substantively it may not. So how does Dworkin apply that formal versus substantive insight here? Well, he says, it's not enough to just give someone the formal democratic right to give voice to their material interests, for instance, say the right to stand up in the legislature and say, I'm starving and that's not just you people, but then to ignore them, to show them substantive treatment as an equal is to actually take care of those needs when that's warranted. And the same would go for providing equal opportunity to work or take care of oneself. And so likewise, it's not enough to just give someone the formal democratic right to give voice to their interests in their rights, not their material interests this time, but their rights, say for instance, to stand up in the legislature and claim, my rights are being trampled upon, I am being oppressed, but then to ignore them, to show them substantive treatment as an equal is to take their voice seriously and to work actively to protect their rights when that's warranted. People, Dworkin is saying, actually have to be substantively granted the rights that are their due, not just formally given the voice to speak about their rights. Then Dworkin says that there are two things that substantive concern and respect for others, that is treating them as equals, two things that that forbids. This argument you'll see in What Rights on 275 to 277. First, you can't base policy justifications on some vision of an ideal community because that wouldn't take seriously the rights of the dissenters from that ideal. And then second, we have to make laws that respect each other as equals. We can't discount how some policy would hurt some members of society just because, for instance, we don't care about them or even perhaps because we hate them. And this is important for understanding Dworkin. Although we can't in every instance know whether some policy is based in the minds of the legislators who voted for it on disrespect for the rights of others, we can at least do this. We can establish through courts a certain list of instituted rights that define for us what it means to respect someone. So Dworkin is saying that to have equal concern and respect for each other's goods, material and rights-based goods is really 
a command of political morality, a command of liberal political morality. It has to inform our politics in multiple ways. And the votes that we take also have to be informed in these ways. We have to take it as a guiding principle for our own political morality. But if we don't live up to this principle of our own political morality, and if the votes that we take in our legislature are later trumped by rights that we've written down in our constitution and that judges have interpreted to be consistent with the constitution, if they do that in order to strike down what we've done in our legislature, Dworkin says there is ultimately no loss to democracy here. The very principles of equal concern and respect that generate the foundation of democracy itself, the formal right to be heard, also generate the substantive rights that we possess, rights that can sometimes be used by judges to overturn a law to trump democratic decisions. And thus he says, there is really no loss to democracy, even when democratically passed laws are trumped in favor of rights. To favor someone's rights over a legislatively approved law is simply to apply the same principles of equal concern and respect that gave life to democracy in the first place. Dworkin says this in the other article, Moral Reading on page 17. When majoritarian institutions provide and respect the democratic conditions, conditions of equal concern and respect, then the verdicts of these institutions should be accepted by everyone for that reason. But when they do not, or when their provision for respect is defective, there can be no objection in the name of democracy to other procedures like courts that protect and respect them better. And thus his pretty clear conclusion is that judicial review of laws that violate rights is a procedure that is better at protecting rights and thus is as democratic as legislation itself. Now to sum this all up, turn to your handout and I'm gonna go through all the arguments in it in the very same way that I did in this lecture just now. The entire argument might be a little bit confusing, but if we go through just four steps really, one, the liberal tradition gives us principles of equal concern and respect. That's the two sides of justice that I mentioned earlier. Two, equal concern and respect generate the right to treatment as an equal, the one that we said would be important to us. Then step 3A, this right to treatment as an equal means first, formally, that our voices must be heard in making social decisions. So thus, equal concern and respect have generated the principle of democracy. And then point 3B is this, that second, that we also have to substantively be treated with equal concern and respect. And so equal concern and respect also generate the argument for rights. And so four, when courts use a right to trump a legislative decision, there is no loss to democracy because we're simply living up to the obligations we have to grant each other equal concern and respect. This, Dworkin says, is the sense in which the American constitution is democratic both in the formal decision-making procedures that it sets up and in the substantive rights that it guarantees and lists off. In both of those things, it fulfills our obligation to live up to the principles that we've committed ourselves to, the principles within the liberal tradition of equal concern and respect, which he says are at the heart of democracy itself. I look forward to discussing this with you and especially his long and drawn out fight about this with Jeremy Waldron when we get together in class. Watch those videos about Jeremy Waldron next. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. And then we'll talk. All right, I'll see you then.